On Halloween 1914, the British Ocean liner Lusitania docked in New York City. A tall, well-dressed man of around 40, with an athletic body starting to go to flab and a slight limp, was among the disembarking passengers. Under his hat was a single, upright, phallic forelock on an otherwise cleanly shaved head. His hands were large and soft and adorned with many rings. The ship's manifest identified him as Edward Alexander Crowley, but then, and ever since, the world has known him as Alistair Crowley. Dubbed by some the wickedest man in the world, he preferred to call himself the Great Beast 666. To some, he was a faker and con man. To others, a spiritual master and misunderstood genius. Regardless, Aleister Crowley was undoubtedly the most influential occultist of the 20th century. And he was also something else, a spy. Over the next five years, Crowley took lots of drugs, had lots of sex, summoned spirits, and had time left over to write, paint, and travel. He spent most of his time in New York, but roamed the United States. Crowley dropped mescaline in the California redwoods, wandered the Hollywood Hills, huffed ether in a New Orleans brothel, and camped out on lonely beaches. In 1919, he confided, I was employed by the Secret Service, my main object being to bring America into the war. His method, he said, was to get the Germans to make asses of themselves by increasing their frightfulness until even the Americans kicked. And it worked, or so he claimed. After the United States entered the war in April 1917, Crowley's pro-German activities drew the attention of American authorities. Some brushed off his claims of working for His Majesty's government as absurd, but investigation revealed otherwise. In July 1918, the British consulate in New York reluctantly revealed that Crowley was an employee of the British government. In this country, an official business of which the British consul has full cognizance. Moreover, the British government was fully aware that Crowley was connected with this German propaganda and received money for writing anti-British articles. In essence, Crowley was acting as an agent provocateur, an agent who gains the enemy's confidence and influences them to commit illegal or self-defeating acts. So his absurd claim turned out to be true. Crowley is the poster boy for what we'll explore in this lecture. The curious connections between secret societies, occultism, and espionage. The secret society occult interplay seems obvious enough. The cut connection with intelligence agencies is a little harder to figure. Basically, spy agencies are bureaucratic secret societies. Their aim is to acquire the secrets of others and conceal their own. They're selective in recruitment and bind members by oaths of silence. They prefer to operate outside of public awareness and scrutiny. The pursuit of occult knowledge is quite similar. As Crowley put it, investigation of spiritualism makes a capital training ground for Secret Service work. One soon gets up to all the tricks. It's not by accident that intelligence professionals are commonly nicknamed spooks. Espionage has its own moral code. One British agent recalled being told at the time of his recruitment that you mustn't be afraid of forgery and you mustn't be afraid of murder. Crowley's personal motto of do what thou wilt fit perfectly. We need a working definition of a cult. While popular imagination connects it with the supernatural or diabolical, it really just means concealed. An occultist seeks to reveal what is hidden, and often as not, reconceal it. A cardinal rule in secret societies is that the knowledge such organizations offer isn't for everyone. It's for the elect, and part of the elect's job is to keep it to themselves. Who exactly was Aleister Crowley? He's commonly regarded as a Satanist, though that's highly debatable. Despite occasional claims to Irish ancestry, he was entirely English. Crowley came from a well-to-do, fundamentalist Christian home. That inspired his desire to start a new religion. He cobbled his mystical experiences and pet beliefs into something he dubbed Thelema, or will. 
Others called it Crowleyanity. He dreamed it would push aside Christianity and usher in a new age of enlightenment. He was also a world-class mountain climber and chess player. Crowley's occultist career began when he joined the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in 1898. The Golden Dawn was among the many esoteric societies that popped up like mushrooms in the 1880s. Its notable members included poet William Butler Yeats and occult scholar Arthur Waite. From the outside, it seemed like a late Victorian gaggle of well-heeled crackpots and eccentric artists. But some members of this secret society harbored a political agenda. It was called legitimism. In practical terms, it meant getting people like Queen Victoria, a German descendant, off the British throne and restoring the rightful Stuart line. It promised to return England to the bosom of the Roman Catholic Church and restore autonomy to Scotland and Ireland. No surprise, then, that the Golden Dawn had more than its share of Irish members, such as Yeats. Some had ties to the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which was a secret society fighting for Irish independence. One leader of the Golden Dawn, the very man who initiated Aleister Crowley, was a British occultist and legitimist named Samuel McGregor Mathers. In turn, Mathers was the close friend of a peculiar English peer named Lord Bertram Ashburnham. Ashburnham was a militant legitimist who operated an armed training camp on his estate. In fact, Mathers, Ashburnham, and other Golden Donners were neck deep in a conspiracy to arm and finance a revolution in Spain. Once successful, they expected the new king, one Don Carlos, to return the favor. So it's not hard to see where the British authorities wanted to know what was going on at those lodge meetings. The man they sent to find out was Aleister Crowley. With Mather's backing, Crowley wormed his way into the Spanish plot, which included smuggling a shipload of arms. Someone, probably Crowley, betrayed it. His joining the Golden Dawn was like tossing a grenade into the room. Crowley's theatrical flamboyance ruffled feathers. He stirred up more trouble by introducing sex into some of their rituals. The result was an internal feud that all that destroyed the Golden Dawn. And that probably suited Crowley's employers just fine. A key element in the Golden Dawn's belief system and Crowley's was a group known as the Secret Chiefs. They were thought to be advanced spiritual beings who mysteriously guided their initiates, turning revelation on and off like a spigot. Interestingly, Crowley compared them to spy chiefs for their tendency to keep us in the dark. The secret chiefs were served by their own secret society, the Great White Lodge. Appropriately, the White Lodge opposed an insidious group known as the Black Lodge and its Black Brothers. The distinction was between white and black magic. Just about everyone Crowley disliked, and there were many, he branded a Black Brother. Despite his reputation as a black magician, Crowley insisted that he really serve the White Lodge. Soon after puncturing the Golden Dawn, Crowley turned up in Mexico. There, he was initiated into the 33rd degree of the Mexican Reformed Rite of Freemasonry, which was a breakaway from the more established Scottish Rite. His sponsor was the local occultist Don Jesus de Medina Sidonia, who was a journalist and a force in Mexican politics. Medina and Crowley then launched their own magical secret society called the Order of the Lamp of Invisible Light, whose rituals included a purported path to invisibility. Medina's bitter enemy was Mexican dictator Porfirio Diaz. And Diaz was also a Freemason who ran Mexico's regular Scottish Rite. At this time, Britain was fighting the Boer War in South Africa. The Boers had sympathizers in Mexico, and some in London feared they might be willing to aid the Boers with arms. In Mexico City, Crowley pretended to be a rogue Irishman named Chevalier Isidore O'Rourke. In an interview, O'Rourke, that is Crowley, blasted the British government for launching a reign of terror against its own people and crushing free speech. 
Most likely, Crowley was trying to draw out Boer supporters, gain their confidence, and betray them. Crowley basically just pulled the same stunt 15 years later in New York. At the time our story begins, an important Irish nationalist known as Sir Roger Casement had just visited the city to negotiate a secret deal for German support of an uprising in Ireland. British intelligence caught wind and proceeded cautiously. America was a neutral country, and the Irish cause enjoyed wide support there. But the Brits knew a secret. Casement was a homosexual, and that offered a means to entrap and compromise him. Crowley was, or affected to be, bisexual. His ability to infiltrate the gay underworld made him ideal to dig up dirt on casement. All unofficially, of course. If Crowley was exposed, London's hands were clean. It's called deniability. When Crowley sailed from England, the British believed that casement was still in New York. But he'd quietly slipped away. So Crowley arrived in Manhattan to find his egg was addled. But he found other ways to be useful. On July 3, 1915, as the first rays of dawn reflected off the Hudson River, ten people gathered on the 50th Street Pier. Leading them was Crowley himself, acting as self-proclaimed leader of Irish hope and representative of the Secret Revolutionary Committee of Public Safety of the Provisional Government of Ireland. Of course, that was an organization that existed only in Crowley's imagination. Two others in tow were bona fide Irish nationalists, but four were just common drunks. Another in attendance was Crowley's current girlfriend, or scarlet woman, named Lila Waddell. She kept everyone entertained, or at least awake, with lively fiddle tunes. Also on hand was a reporter from the New York Times. Crowley wanted to be sure the event got plenty of publicity. After rowing out to Liberty Island, he went into high gear, swearing an oath to revolution and ostentatiously tearing up his British passport. He next declared war on England and swore to fight to the last drop of his blood for Irish freedom. It was pure theater. Crowley later admitted he knew almost nothing about Ireland or its struggle for independence. His real passport was safe back in his room. He'd torn up an envelope. Nor was he really trying to impress the Irish revolutionaries in New York. The Germans were his target. The chief German propagandist in New York, a man named George Sylvester Virek, had already hired Crowley to write anti-British articles for his magazine, The Fatherland. Handily, Virek was an aspiring occultist and a secret society member with a fondness for drugs and orgies. Through Virek, Crowley gained the ear of the so-called Propaganda Cabinet. This was a secret group that included German-American journalists and academics, as well as German officials, like the Kaiser's military attaché in Washington, Franz von Papen. Eighteen years later, von Papen would be one of the men who made Adolf Hitler Chancellor of Germany. As much as the British wanted to draw the United States into the war, the Germans wanted to keep them out. The question was, how? Crowley said that at a March 1915 cabinet meeting, he gradually got the Germans to believe that arrogance and violence were the best policy. The Americans, he explained, were like children, easily frightened and responsive to firmness. Crowley bamboozled, or maybe even hypnotized, the Germans into believing that his study of the occult gave him insight into the mass psychology of Americans and British. The big topic of discussion that day was the ocean liner Lusitania. The vessel was the pride of the British liner fleet. The Germans knew it was being used to ferry war supplies from New York to Liverpool. That made it a military target. But the sticking point was the hundreds of innocent passengers on board. Would the propaganda benefit from sinking the Lusitania be offset by the negative publicity? Crowley argued, no. The propaganda cabinet forwarded his opinion to Berlin. And on 7th May 1915, a German U-boat torpedoed the Lusitania off the coast of Ireland. Over a thousand people perished. 
Though the United States wouldn't join the war for two more years, Germany's reputation was now thoroughly blackened in the eyes of much of the American public. Did Crowley exaggerate his influence? Probably, but that's not to say he didn't have any. The real key to Crowley gaining German confidence wasn't Virek, but a man high in the German secret service named Theodore Reuss. Before World War I, Reuss had worked in London as a journalist. He was also a secret society initiate and spy. Reuss pitched the Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO, of which he was a member, as a one-stop occult superstore. Starting in Germany around 1903, the OTO aspired to unify other esoteric societies under its banner. Its claimed affiliates included the Illuminati, the Knights Templar, the Masonic Rite of Memphis Mizraim, and the Rosicrucians. More importantly, perhaps, the OTO served as a cover for German intelligence. In 1912, Royce initiated Crowley into the OTO in Berlin. Crowley then became chief of the order's operations in English-speaking countries. He even got a new mystical name, Baphomet, which is the idol supposedly worshipped by the Knights Templar. Whether Royce simultaneously enlisted Crowley into German intelligence, or thought he did, is another question. Regardless, he and Crowley maintained clandestine contact throughout World War I, while Crowley secretly worked for Britain and America, and as Royce served as the Kaiser's agent in Holland and Switzerland. After Royce died, Crowley later managed to grab control of the OTO, or a faction of it. And the OTO is still very much alive, along with accusations that it's linked to intelligence activity. In the 1960s, the leader of a Brazilian OTO faction, Marcelo Ramos Mota, accused the main order of being a tool of the CIA and Britain's MI6, used for ideological warfare. The current OTO leadership absolutely denies any such relationship, and no one has produced proof. Of course, how exactly would you do that? Crowley's own story continues to World War II, when he was again called on to render secret service to king and country. But Crowley is hardly the only example of murky connections between secret societies, occultism, and espionage. Another was Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Russian-born Blavatsky was the founder of Theosophy. Basically, Blavatsky mixed Western occultism with elements of Hinduism and Buddhism to create an exotic system of spiritual enlightenment. She was inspired by her great-grandfather, Pavel Dolgoruki, a Freemason and Rosicrucian who possessed a library of rare and occult books. Blavatsky established the Theosophical Society in New York in 1875, assisted by men like the socialist journalist Charles Sutheran who was yet another Freemason and Rosicrucian. Theosophy, or divine wisdom, sought to create a universal syncretic religion. Blavatsky did much to popularize Hinduism and Buddhism in the West, and she is the mother of the New Age movement. Theosophists believe that spiritual evolution is guided by ascended masters, or Mahatmas. Blavatsky gave them exotic names like Kuthumi and Master Moria, and portrayed them as quasi-divine beings levitating somewhere in the Himalayas. Blavatsky's Mahatmas were basically identical to Crowley's secret chiefs. They even belonged to the same Great White Lodge, which, in Blavatsky's version, functioned as an inner government of the world. And they were opposed by the same evil Black Lodge. Blavatsky claimed to channel the Mahatmas by using her powers as a medium. She produced letters from them, apparently written in different hands. However, Blavatsky's claims came under the scrutiny of the Society for Psychical Research, or SPR, which investigated claims of the paranormal and supernatural, especially mediums. In 1886, the SPR branded Blavatsky a fake and liar. They detailed how she'd concocted the Mahatma's letters and other evidence. Blavatsky's reputation never quite recovered, but most of her followers stuck with her. As it turns out, Blavatsky's masters weren't entirely fictional. Invented names disguised real persons. 
For instance, her co-founder, Charles Southern, was a master, as was her great-grandfather. Another was the Italian nationalist, revolutionary, and Freemason, Giuseppe Mazzini. The masters also included Indian nationalists and members of the revolutionary secret society, the Carbonari. Theosophy was to be a stepping stone to a brotherhood of humanity, a new world order based on enlightened spiritual principles. But there wasn't anything democratic about it. The masters ruled and everyone else obeyed. After Blavatsky died in 1891, the Theosophical Society splintered. The main faction ended up under Annie Besant, an English woman of even more radical tendencies. Besant was a Fabian socialist and a founder of co-masonry, the branch that initiated women. She was also a militant supporter of Indian nationalism. She gravitated to communism in the 1920s. Winston Churchill spymaster Desmond Morton later concluded that nearly all these theosophists and theosophical societies are connected in some way with Bolshevism, Indian revolutionaries, and other unpleasant activities. Crowley, as a secret servant of the crown, despised Besant. He damned her as a shameless, nauseating fraud, and worse, a member of the evil Black Brotherhood. Still, the names of Crowley and Besant sometimes turned up together. In 1926, an Irish theosophist named Violet Gibson tried to assassinate Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. But her bullet only grazed his nose. Officially, the whole thing was treated as the act of a crazy woman. Unofficially, Italian investigators believed there was a dangerous conspiracy at work and Crowley was somehow mixed up in it. Gibson confessed to knowing a Sicilian nobleman the Duke of Cesaro. The Duke was a former minister in Mussolini's government and a member of several secret societies, including Theosophy and the irregular Masonic rite of Memphis Mizraim. Cesaro was also a friend of the British consul in Palermo, Sicily, Reginald McBean. And McBean was also a Theosophist and a member of Memphis Mizraim. And who was another good pal of McBean? Why, Alistair Crowley, who was yet another initiate of Memphis Mizraim. Plus, just a few years earlier, Crowley had run a spiritual commune in northern Sicily, right in McBean's and Cesaro's backyard. So you can see where the Italians were suspicious. Some suspected that Gibson had been hypnotically programmed to take a shot at Mussolini. And who was an expert in hypnotism? Once again, Aleister Crowley. Another who smelled a collusion between theosophy and London spies was French occultist René Guénon. Even though British intelligence outwardly regarded theosophy as a pro-Bolshevik cabal, what better than an outwardly anti-British organization to serve as a cover for British intrigues? Another notable theosophist collaborated with Soviet intelligence. This was Russian artist and explorer Nikolai Konstantinovich Rerik. Like many educated Russians, Rerik had fled his homeland during the chaos of revolution and civil war. But by the early 1920s, he was itching to return. Rerik, through his medium wife, Helena, claimed his own communication with Master Moria and the Mahatmas and claimed to see a convergence between the ideas of communism and theosophy. Both aspired to create a new world order based on brotherhood. Rerik became a Soviet agent of influence, and he lobbied Bolshevik leaders to dispatch him as a missionary to Tibet and to other areas of the Buddhist East. He found supporters, too. One was Gleb Boki, a high-ranking member of the secret police, or Agpu. A dedicated communist, Boki was a devoted student of the occult. Before the revolution, he'd been a Freemason and a brother of the Kabbalistic Order of the Rose Cross. And he might have dabbled in Satanism, too. On a practical level, Boki saw the pursuit of mystical knowledge to be excellent cover for intelligence gathering. In late 1923, Rerik got the okay to lead an expedition to Tibet. This took him through part of the British Himalayas. 
Soviet intelligence and political agents were attached to his party, disguised as religious pilgrims. One was Yakov Blumkin, among the most experienced and resourceful of Soviet spies. A kind of Red James Bond. At bottom, Rurik used communism to advance theosophical interests, while the Kremlin masters used theosophy to advance communist ones. In response to Indian officials' concerns about Rurik, British intelligence officer Vivian Burberry advised that India reach out to another man whom he said had curiously intimate knowledge of all these things, Aleister Crowley. Rurik and his brand of theosophy also spread their influence to America. During the 1920s, he cultivated a following among wealthy spiritual seekers in New York and other cities. One of them was millionaire Wall Street broker Louis Horsch. In 1934, through the Horsch crowd, Rurik met Henry Wallace, President Franklin Roosevelt's Secretary of Agriculture. This was the same Henry Wallace who helped persuade FDR to put the Great Seal on the dollar bill. Wallace became one of Rurik's devotees. In correspondence, he gushingly addressed the Russian as Dear Guru. Wallace even got Roosevelt to sign off on a bizarre scheme to dispatch Rurik to Mongolia and Manchuria. His supposed job there was to collect samples of drought-resistant grasses for dust bowl research. Rurik's real mission, at least as he saw it, was to instigate a revolt to create a vast pan-Buddhist empire in Central Asia. When this became known, Wallace dropped Rurik like a hot potato. The real question is whether Rurik was still acting as a Soviet agent of influence. Regardless, those dear guru letters came back to haunt Wallace when he tried to run for president in 1948. Just in case you're wondering if somehow Hitler and the Nazis slip into the story, well, of course. But in the person not of Hitler, but a mind reader and astrologer named Erik Jan Hanussen. At the start of the 1930s, Hanussen was one of the most famous and most influential men in Berlin. And as you might expect, he wasn't really Erik Hanussen. He was a Czech Jew, born Herschmann Steinschneider, whose hometown of Prosnitz was a hotbed of the so-called Sabbatean heresy. This secretive sect revered a 17th century false messiah named Sabadai Zevi. How closely Hanussen was connected to the Sabbatean sect is uncertain, but his penchant for flaunting convention, sexual and otherwise, fit the bill. Hanussen settled in Berlin in 1930. His popular stage shows were attended by Marlene Dietrich and Peter Lorre, among others. And he built a lavish establishment grandly dubbed the Palace of the Occult. Hanussen's astoundingly accurate predictions soon drew attention. Many of these dealt with the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party. And Hanussen, despite his Jewish origins, won friends and admirers among the Nazi elite. One of them was the Berlin brown shirt leader, Count Wolf von Helldorf, a man noted for his addiction to gambling and his interest in the black arts. Hanussen willingly indulged both. By 1932, the friendship with Helldorf led to an introduction to Hitler. Hanussen soothed Hitler's insecurities by assuring him that the stars decreed he would become Chancellor of Germany, which he did. But not long after, Hanussen's decomposing corpse was found outside Berlin. The common assumption is they had a falling out with his Nazi friends. But the night before the infamous Reichstag fire, Hanussen had publicly prophesied a terrible conflagration. Now, you had to believe that Hanussen either had genuine psychic powers or inside information about Nazi plans. The latter, arguably, made Hanussen a loose cannon. He also made it his business to collect and sell secrets. He secretly filmed seances and orgies he hosted at his palace and on his yacht. His access to high-ranking Nazis offered all sorts of possibilities. Hanussen was exactly the unscrupulous insider that any self-respecting intelligence agency would love to tap. And guess who else was living in Berlin at the same time? Why, once again, Aleister Crowley. And once again, he was working for British intelligence. 
His job was keeping an eye on certain people in Berlin. One of them must have been Hannesen. So you see, secret societies, occultism, and espionage fit together very nicely. And once again, secret societies are the invisible links that connect people, organizations, and events.